A uh, question for the organizers. I do presume that we need to make up some time by shortening the uh, discussion session. Um, okay, uh, we've uh, invited, and I pr also presume that uh, Dr. Burlingame, that you're also uh, still on the phone to answer questions and participate in the panel discussion. So uh, can we lead off? Do we have questions from the floor for the panel? Yes. So, uh, can we lead off? Do we have questions from the floor for the panel? Yes. Right. Dr. Mitloner. Uh, a question and comment for you. My name is Alyssa Lane. I'm with the Humane Society of the United States. You mentioned the study, the one study that pointed to 3.4% of emissions coming from animal agriculture. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on the numerous studies that have been published in the U.S. and around the world that, that have stated that our diets can have a great impact um, on, on climate change. Um, I was wondering, for example, in 2010, there was a study published in the National Academy of Sciences that says if we in the United States reduce consumption of animal products, we can have a significant impact on climate change. So I was wondering if the study you pointed to is a whole life cycle study and what your comments are. Okay. Um, the, the study I, 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 uh, I cited was the emission inventory of the Environmental Protection Agency for this year. Uh, these are the official uh, numbers for the United States for livestock. The total contribution of agriculture in the emission inventory is around 6%. So animals and crops combined contribute approximately 6%, a little bit over 6% of the total carbon footprint of the US. Again, uh, transportation was cited as 26%, energy production and use 31%. Um, this was a total life cycle assessment. And, um, now, the second part of your question, um, is this a significant contribution of, our, of all of our uh, activities to the carbon footprint of this country? The answer is yes, it is. And uh, can a change in our eating habits affect the, this carbon footprint portion? Yes, it can. But I'm cautioning people to think that eating one day less meat a week will make a huge difference to the carbon footprint of this country. It will have an impact, but that impact will be around 0.2%. And if people make that choice, they should, but they should know what it is. They should know that what some people suggest uh, is exaggerated. I heard a, a, a show the other day where the moderator said, and I quote, he said, according to the United Nations, if you drive a Prius, and you eat one burger a week, then that's the same as driving a Hummer. That might sound cute to people, but I think it's dangerous. Because what it suggests is that, that your transportation choices don't matter, but exclusive you, exclusively uh, your, your food choices do. And I think that's sending us in the wrong direction. Okay, thank you. Can a question from the right over here? Conferencing. It's not me. <laughs> I have. Uh, thank you very much for the session. I have two questions. One for uh, for Cynthia, which is a curiosity question on um, your uh, the global data that you shared on how short we're going to be on fish. Is this factoring in all the overfishing of predators and? shark finning and tuna in the Mediterranean and everything that's going on? Or is this regardless of what's happening in overfishing? Complicated answer. Um, a lot, I'm, I'm going to say almost what Frank is going to say. You have to be careful when you look at statistics that you don't do these global averages and just use the average across the boards. 
Um, and that's why in my talk I talked about the U.S. and then I talked globally, because there's difference in management. In most of the developing countries, the management is geared towards a precautionary approach to maximum sustainable yield. Maximum sustainable yield means not that the fish community is at its most, its most abundant, but somewhere near a midway point where it's most productive. That's a difficult balance to achieve, and so most developed countries with good management have opted to do below that. So there is, were one to be able to do this perfectly, there, there clearly you could get more production from the system if you didn't have stochasticity. In the developed countries, the, the, with, with stock assessments, there's about 14% collapsed fishery fisheries. And what you have to ask there is, uh, which species are they? How much production is there? I specifically showed you a slide in U.S. that the predominant, the most abundant two fish in production, Alaska Pollock and Atlantic Menhaden, in fact, um, are in relatively good shape. There's an issue now that there may be some overfishing of Menhaden. But it's not overfished. It's still in a productive, a putatively productive range by stock assessment. There's some issues as to whether there's enough recruitment going on, but that may in fact be global climate change and environment. So these are very difficult questions to answer. The other thing about the global statistics is you have very poor statistics coming out of Africa where you have things like the Benguela current, which is a very productive area and you have very poor statistics coming out of China. I think the statistics of 80 to 100 million metric tons of capture fisheries is probably a pretty solid statistic. I think the issue of aquaculture is less so. In terms of predators, predator biomass I mean, that's, that's another issue where we have to go into region by region specifics. It's a popular and, and capturing argument that really does have to be discussed uh, more precisely. And I think Ray Hilborn is doing a very nice job of doing that right now with his articles. Uh, you have to look at where your most productivity is, and your most productivity isn't sitting in the top predators. It's sitting in things like Alaska, Pollock, and Menhaden. And so improving top predators is going to change the system because it's going to change the species mix. But it may not make a difference in terms of boosting productivity generally. You may do better to produce boost productivity by by doing better at managing your lower level species. Thank you. Welcome to Unified Conferencing. My second question, maybe uh, it, as to Dr. Uh, Berenkam, is I was curious to know what are the uh, strategies of FAO. And I mean, we've seen that water is lacking, land is lacking. Um, what are the strategies in um, increasing the crop by drop uh, that you are considering? I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Berlingame, did you hear the question? Uh, there are a number of uh, strategies uh, that are... Um, Sorry, Dr. Berlingame, did you hear the question? Yes, I heard the question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the strategies... Uh, there are a number of uh, strategies uh, that are... Um, Sorry, Dr. Berlingame, did you hear the question? Okay, uh, can you hear me better now? The, um, there are a number of strategies to deal with uh, the... Um, natural resource issues. Uh, one was mentioned by the, uh, by the third speaker in the session, uh, sustainable production intensification. Uh, conservation agriculture is, uh, is one of those uh, strategies that's being used. Uh, there are, I, I, but again, it's, uh, it's like all these issues. It is based on 
uh, assessment of the particular agroecological zone and what techniques and strategies can be used there uh, to maximize production and minimize uh, environmental damage and waste of environmental resources. But one of the big issues uh, that needs to be taken into consideration is the food losses and waste because uh, based on studies done by FAO and World Wildlife Fund, when you waste resources in the developed world, it is, uh, or when you waste food in the developed world, it is a waste of resources from developing countries where many of these foods are produced. So I think if we can uh, employ methods of conservation agriculture and other, um, other techniques like that, uh, minimize food losses and waste as far as possible, uh, and, uh, and be mindful of the way we produce and eat, and not uncouple production and consumption uh, so that we uh, so that we can still, it, it's ironic that we might have uh, not be addressing production side of livestock and simply not eat meat on Mondays. That doesn't solve the problem. Uh, so considering that couple that should not be separated, production and consumption, uh, and being responsible uh, growers, being responsible eaters, and uh, being responsible uh, planetary citizens, I think. Uh, and considering that agriculture is, uh, is fundamental to all these environmental issues, I think it's how we have to proceed. And there are many techniques, modern techniques, and also looking back at some traditional agricultural practices. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If we could ask for fairly uh, sharp answers to questions. We've uh, got at least three more from the audience, and we've got three minutes left in our section. On the left here, please. Thank you. This is for uh, Dr. Mitloner. Uh, I'm curious how the um, greenhouse gas footprint of the modern-day uh, dairy and beef herds of North America might compare to the estimated greenhouse gas footprint of the indigenous bison herd of, say, 16 or 1700. Has anybody ever estimated that? Um, yes, that was published actually last year. Last year, somebody published a paper comparing the bison herds versus today's beef herd. And the bison herd was slightly lower than the beef herd, but that was uh, because of numbers on the one hand. Uh, the reason why the bison herd was high was because um, they entirely eat roughage, 100% roughage and of course they're ruminants, and what produces the methane are microbes in the rumen. Uh, the methane is then belched out. So the problem with bison is they live so long. I, I know that sounds weird, but they live so long, and beef animals don't live very long. I mean, particularly if they're finished in feedlots, then they go to the packing plant uh, between 14 and, si and 16, maybe 18 months of age. And so they don't live very long before they go to slaughter versus a bison that, that does live very long. So um, if you compare it, life cycle assessment wise, the bison versus beef herd, they are approximately, this, approximately the same. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Can a question from the right? Yes. My name is Jillian Fry, and I work for the Johns Hopkins Center for Livable Future. And I have a question for Professor Mitloner. Um, in terms of trade-offs between human and environmental health, I'm wondering if you can comment on the numerous externalities that you did not comment on your talk, especially having to do with intensification of meat production. Um, some examples are water contamination from animal waste, especially affecting drinking water for rural populations on well water, pesticide use for feed production that's not organic, um, antibiotic use, especially how it's associated with intensification of animal production. If animals are crowded together, a lot of times um, they're given routine antibiotics in their feed, and that leads to antibiotic resistance, um, not only in the community and with workers, um, but also on the meat and affecting consumers. And also air quality impacts from particulate matter and gases, which is intensified when the animals are crowded together. And I'm concerned that that was not addressed in your talk. Yeah, uh, of course, a very loaded question, and I only have a very short period of time. You to do it as, as briefly as possible. Yeah. So, so I will 30 have seconds to, left and one more question. I will have to talk to you in, in depth later, but of course, externalities exist, no doubt about it. 
if the animals roam around freely, uncontrolled, then you have no control over what happens to the excreta. They fall down and then they affect what they affect, whether it's water or, or ground or whatever they affect. Whereas if you do have intensive uh, production, then you do collect those waste streams. You collect them and if you collect them, then you can manage them. So for example, you can have a 16,000 head dairy, and I've seen it, that collects all, it, all of its manure and runs all of its manure through digesters, producing power, the nutrients that remain are then applied to crops at agronomic rates. Not that at... That's not true. That, well, I'm sorry. In the U.S. Okay, okay well, can, we, can, can we continue this, this offline for those who are interested? Well, I think it's important for the audience to understand that the arguments put forth on the non-importance of reducing uh, meat intake in the U.S. Um, is, is very narrow, and I'm very concerned that the audience here is not... Um, hearing about the other uh, human health and environmental concerns associated with meat production, especially intensification of meat production. So I do think it's important for your audience to hear about those issues. Okay, well, we are out of time for this discussion, so if you, if you don't mind, can sure. we move on to the final question? Um, yes, on the uh, left. Cedric Baker, Mercy University College of Pharmacy. My question is for Dr. Burlingame, who I'm not sure is even still with us. But just for the sake of, of making the point, it was an observational add-on on her point on biodiversity in indigenous cultures, especially the data from Thailand, is very telling. Having spent the last dozen years studying the medical ethnobotany of traditional Thai food ways, the 17,000 varieties of, of rice that are now reduced to 37 is very telling. So the real, to me, the real key for the biodiversity especially with plant-based foods, is also the density of this biodiversity. And that comes from these, this variety of cultivars. So traditional uh, indigenous peoples have an incredible amount of knowledge that we can use synergistically to optimize using the environment and our human nutrition dietary supplies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and thank you very much for the audience for your participation and your questions. I think if I can sum her up in one, in one sentence, I think uh, dietary guidelines as we develop in the future have got to consider the environment as well. But I was also cautious that as the discussion this morning has showed that that's going to be no easy task. We will understand how difficult it is to come up with dietary recommendations, and then when you learn the environmental and distribution factors that have to be considered on top of that, it's going to be quite a task. And, uh, but nevertheless, it's something I think that's important to do. So if we could have a round of applause for the speakers this morning. Thank you for... Uh, we reconvene in 15 minutes? Uh, 11.25. 11.25. Yep, thank you. Okay.